we're ready when you are. Let's go. Hey, 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 people. Welcome back to another episode of Dressing Room Banter with me, Dexter Whitehead. And today I am absolutely over the moon by the guests that we've managed to get onto the show. Uh, ecstatic is beyond words. A real big fan of this guy and have been since a very little boy. Thank you to my friends, uh, Peter and Mel Smith, for helping me out and sort this out. But please welcome Mr. Jeffrey Holland. Hello, hello, Dexter. How lovely. Lovely to see you. Right, so Jeff, I don't know if you've listened to any of our episodes, but what we normally do is try and take people back to the very beginning when they first discovered their love for performance. So we're talking before your Heidi High days and when you were you were in Warsaw, where we are now, yeah? Um, and how you got into it, really? Your friend and mine, Peter Smith, was responsible, really, for me becoming an actor in the first place. Because so he and I used to go to... Uh, um, what turned out to be a rather boring youth club uh, every Sunday evening. And uh, he found, I don't quite know how he found it, but he found this amateur drama group uh, run by the co-op in Warsaw. It was in the old square. Oh, or the yeah. old there. And uh, <clears throat> he came to me one Sunday at the youth club and said, um, I found this amateur dramatic um, group for under 21s. And we were about 15 the time uh, and he said well you want to come with me next Friday you know it'd be, it'd be more exciting than this and I said what do you mean and I'm at a, what are you talking about and he said well you know it's a drum group for, for under 21 literally for us and I said what do you mean what do they do and he said well they read plays and you know act and put shows on and I said act you mean get up and perform in front of people because I'd never done any of that you see uh, and he said, yeah, I suppose so. Yes, of course, that's what they do. And uh, I said, uh, uh, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> and he said, he suddenly said, the girls are very pretty. <laughs> and I said, what time do you want me? <laughs> and so that say was that brilliant so you did nothing from nothing from your family or anything like that this was all mr smith's fault then that you got into it peter smith's fault yes and i went along with him to the uh, the meeting that following friday and he was dead right the girls some of the girls were very very pretty most of them <laughs> and That's I brilliant. take a, a couple of them out for a short time uh and then I, but the thing was with me i've never done performing before and we all sat around in a big circle and we we sat and we read uh, a play. There was a lot of us, quite, you know, quite a few members of the group. We sat and read a play, uh, we read through part of a play, and it was called 1066 and all that. And most amateur societies know that piece because it's there are so many in the cast that it gives every member a chance to get on stage and play a bit. Exactly. So uh, well, that's what we did. We read this piece. And when we was, uh, started to read it, I was reading this scene as, as King John, this, this funny little piece as King John, and I heard laughter. <laughs> and I went, bing, something went click in me. And I thought, I like that. I'm having some more of this. So I carried on and I heard some more laughter. And that was really the beginning of what... In, you know, ended up with me be becoming best known for comedy because I I, I, I realised then I had a, a knack for it. It's really uh, funny, actually, because normally we, it, when I'm doing these episodes, I get onto that why people do it and what the real heart of it is. Obviously, now it's a great wage for you at the end of the day, but before then, you know, with the amateur people that I've had on, why do you do it for the lo for the love of it and and whatever? But you've just explained that really quickly and easily. You you got the bug of the laughter and you realised that you were good at it. Became an actor uh, due simply because of my raging hormones. <laughs> <laughs> to, to get the girls, that's what I like. I think that, a, a, a lot of a lot of straight males in the theatre that I know feel exactly the same. I, I, I wouldn't like to doubt for one second that that's not the reason that they did it. <laughs> so then. Let's let's talk because obviously you did some amateur stuff and you obviously yeah. went just trid the boards um, through a amateur stage and things like that. 
how did the big breaks happen? Because you obviously started off before Heidi High. You'd got quite a lot of little roles, hadn't you, in um, stuff like, well, not little roles, but smaller parts in Coronation Street and Crossroads, for instance. And um, Yes, way back, yeah. What, uh, what happened was I was very lucky when I, I decided to go pro and train. <clears throat> I got into a, a drama school in Birmingham. Uh, in Edgbaston, uh, called the Birmingham School of Speech Training and Dramatic Arts, as it was known then. It's still there. It's called the Birmingham Theatre School, I think. Right? Okay. Uh, but the, the personnel have changed. And But it was three very, very happy years for me training uh, to become a professional actor. And when I left there, I very quickly snapped up by <clears throat> a, a, a director at the Belgrade Theatre in Coventry, uh, having lived in Walsall, trained in Birmingham, and I suddenly moved to Coventry. So I was still in the Midlands, and uh, I got a job uh, basically as walking furniture in a, in a production. They were looking for young lads who could uh, speak a bit, act a bit, and um, push furniture about because it was a very it was a <laughs> can I be kind? Yes, I can. It was a very well intentioned, but sort of slightly bad choice. Okay. War and Peace by oh. Leo Tapley. War and Peace. Oh, <laughs> stage gosh. production of War and Peace. I mean, the thing ran three and three quarter hours. I mean, the audience were there all night, you know, and so were we. Oh, but uh, it was a good start for me because I, I, I started to learn my trade. I, I trained, but they can't teach you to act. You have to learn the business. You know, they're going to train you in technique. Mm -hmm. uh, so I got on there. I got stuck in, and they offered me the following play of that season as well. I thought I was only there for the one, the one thing. Oh, uh, so these digs in Coventry, and I spent the best part of the next five years uh, working in rep at the uh, Belgrade. Well, uh, it was yeah. so Let's I talk stopped. about rep then, because we don't—you don't see as much of it these days, do you? Um, oh, no, of it now. No. How how difficult was that? Because for the, okay, so for some of my younger listeners who might not understand what rep is, one week you are rehearsing a play and in another play on the evening, and then the next week that play will open that you were rehearsing in the daytime the week before. Yes, that, that's weekly rep. I was lucky. We we did three weekly rep. Oh, okay. But three weeks rehearsing the next play while we were playing the play in the evening. So we had a. It, it was much more relaxed, if you could call it that. It was a bit manic, to be say the least. You know, you it's were doing still, all that. It still uh, seems uh, tricky for me to get my head round the fact that you're concentrating on one character on the evening and then you're learning a new character. But I guess that's why you trained, and <laughs> that's the art. People say that to me. I, I just, it, I'm not being glib, but I say that's what we do. Yes, of course. It's what we do. Uh, how do you learn your lines? Well, that's what we do. You know, we learn them. How do you learn your lines? I've heard that a million times anyway. Even on the amateur stage, we hear that all the time. But, uh, yeah. but we do. That's what we do. Because we have to. And um, and I spent very uh, five very happy years, well, you know, near the Belgrade, doing everything from... You know, melodrama, Shakespeare, uh, Agatha Christie, pantomime, musical theatre. I learned to dance. I have danced in West Side Story. Have you? you? <laughs> I have danced in West Side Story. Yes, I played action, one of the jets in that. I know great. it very well. I know it very well. So, 70, I think it was one of the first great revivals of West Side Story. In 1970 at the Coventry Belgrade. And what uh, a show to, to to dance in, though. It's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful piece of show. So before we go on to um, Heidi High and that kind of uh, route that you took, just quickly let me flash back to that Crossroads mention, because I remember it as a little boy. Were the sets really quite as wobbly as what they looked on TV? <laughs> yes. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very low budget series, to be honest. It really was, but uh, I think Noel Gordon took most of the money. Oh, but it was it was a, it was a, a very popular series, and uh, I was lucky to. I did ten episodes spread over six weeks. Oh wow! There was this really ridiculous character called Mike Hawkins, who was in the boring market selling uh -huh. fruit and veg. Yeah, because it's it's a it's a Birmingham based uh, crossroads motel, wasn't it? You know, I, I mean, I was a very little boy, so I can't remember it very well, but I do remember the wobbly sets. 
You don't need to remember it. Trust me. <laughs> okay, it, so then you went on and you played some, started to do some comedy roles, such as you know, it ain't half, half much. <laughs> It ain't a. I can't even say it now. You say it for me, Jeff. You know what I'm on about. It ain't half up, mum. Yeah. Um, are you being served, etc. And then obviously, um, Spike was really made for you, from what I what I guess. I mean, I could tell you the story about how that came about. I was doing a, a season in Chichester at the festival in Chichester in 1975, uh, and I was really in a very bad mood because I was only doing the first two plays of the four play season. And I was sharing a house with two other actors uh, and they were staying on through the whole season and I had to go because there was nothing for me in the, the, the third and fourth play. Oh. So I w- And then I got a phone call from my the, that agent who asked me to come up to London and, and audition for Roger Redfarn, who had directed me at Coventry. So he asked for me because he knew I could be quite useful to them in, in this stage production of Dad's Army. Oh. They were putting it on stage in the West End. Oh. A, a chorus of boys and girls, we call the ensemble, um, to cover an understudy and to dance and sing and do all the filling in bits. So I went up to do all this audition in a very, very bad mood because I wasn't, I was having to leave Chichester and I was having such a wonderful time. It was a beautiful summer, uh, summer of 75. Wow. And it was a lovely summer. Trust me, I'm probably too young to remember it, but I, I do. And it was a lovely summer uh, and I had to go and I was a, a bit brassed off, shall we say, putting it politely. Uh, so I went up to London in a terrible mood on the train to this audition at the Mermaid Theatre. And I had to meet Jimmy Perry and David Croft and get past them because Roger Redfarn wanted me and he, you know, I had to audition for them because they were basically responsible for the show. And I, I turned up in the foulest of moods with nothing ready, nothing prepared at all. Um, and I thought, well, if they want me to sing, I'll sing, oh, they'll be hanging out the washing of the sea free line. Every, you know, it's something <laughs> Uh, and I was handed the script to look at before I went in to, to meet them. And I, I flipped through it, I figured through it, and uh, I found this parody of Yes, We Have No Bananas, which was a very popular wartime song. And it, this parody in the show was sung by Walker, Private Walker, the Spiv. Yes. Uh, and, of course, Jimmy Beck, James Beck, who played Walker, was, uh, died two years previous to the show. But they put the character back in because it was such a good foil for Captain yes. Mount. And it was played in the, in the main cast by John Barton, who was best known for playing Jim in EastEnders, who married Dot. Oh, yeah, I know him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bless him. He's, he's, he's left us now. He was a splashy bloke, and I, I, I really enjoyed his company. But he played Walker. And I was uh, asked to read uh, in the audition I went up for, for Jimmy and David. And I was given the script and I read a couple of parts and I played this silly sort of German idiotic character, a bit like Sam Kelly's character in Hello, Hello. You know, I'm oh, yeah, yeah. Hello, and all that silly voice stuff. Uh, and uh, I read this scene and uh, Jimmy and David were falling about laughing. Jimmy and David Croft, you know, the writers, they were falling about laughing, and I, I thought, oh, I'm in, I think I'm in here. And my morale was going up because I, I, I tell you, I arrived in a foul mood. Yeah, that bad week suddenly turning itself around. My morale was, was going up, way up. And uh, the company manager who was reading with me, I had to read as Private Pike, and he read as Sergeant Wilson so badly it made me look brilliant, you know. And, <laughs> so, anyway. I, to cut a long story short, uh, I got the job. Wow. Asked to play in the ensemble uh, and to understudy Pike okay. and to understudy Walker. And did you so go I, on as any of them? I did, I did understudy both of them. Uh, I never went on as Walker, but I did go on as Pike once. once. I did a, a mat- Yeah, I did a matinee performance at the Shaftesbury Theatre as, as Private Pike because Ian Lavender was indisposed for reasons I forget at the moment. Um, and I, I got all the word. I was so proud. I got all the words out in the right order. <laughs> Get a single laugh from the audience. 
No one laughed. Because I wasn't Ian Lavender. Oh, dear. So forgiving. The only laughs I was getting was from the kids behind me in the chorus on stage. Because they was, knew that you were sweating. My sleeves, because I wasn't getting laughs. You know, I don't, it's a humiliating experience. But everybody in the show, at the end of the day, I was congratulated, slapped on the back, congratulated for getting it right and helping them out, and it was all lovely. Of course. Come the tour, we did six months in the West End, and then in the spring of 76, they decided to take the show out on a national tour uh -huh. of all the big theatres in the UK. And then I got a phone call one day from Jimmy Perry saying, would I like to play Walker? Yeah. Because John Barr had got other stuff to do and he didn't want to do the tour. He got all these other things to do. I thought it was a bit short-sighted of him, but he went on to do what he wanted to do, and I took over as Walker. And on the first night, my first night as Walker, Nottingham Theatre Royal, you know, the, the curtain went up, and there was Mannering in the platoon all standing with my rifle, you know, at the ready. With tears rolling down my face. I was so proud. Oh, I was wow. And just so, so moved to be a part of Captain Mannering's platoon oh, with all wow. the TV cast, you know, except John Lowry. He wasn't there because his wife wasn't well and he couldn't do that. But, you I know, mean, it was... It's testament of, to that, Dad's Army. Snowballed into Heidi High for me. Yeah. It, I mean, Dad's Army, let's just say, it is testament to it. It's still being done today in amateur productions and uh, obviously it's such a... It works so well. So it, it, it it's the same as Heidi High. There's, you know, there's a musical version of that that still goes on today and people still have so much fondness and um, love for it. It's crazy. I get emails all the time from the amateur show uh, companies that are doing Heidi High, the show. And, you know, well, I wish them well on the first night. I'm more than happy to do that, you know. I, just, yes. I always say, I just hope you have as much fun doing it as, as I did. Have you have you ever seen it? Have you ever seen it put on um, on an amateur circuit or on any circuit? And what was their spike like? Was it was it, was it very strange watching that? <laughs> it wasn't as good as me. But... Yeah. <laughs> No, no, it was lovely. It's lovely to see it, actually. It's lovely to see it being done because it's done with such love and affection. Um, you know, people say to me, you know, oh, Heidi, hi. Oh, I bet you get sick of people saying that to you, don't you? And I say, no, I don't. So, no, I'm very, very, very happy when that, because people remember it with such love. You know. and, and this is what I was going to say. I don't want to talk too much about Heidi High because you've got a lot more strings to your bows. And I know that in the past you've spoken about it quite a lot. But obviously for me, as a little boy, that's where I fell in love with you as Spike and that whole persona. And, and particularly what I really loved was the relationship between you and Ted. That, that friendship is just... you cannot that's the kind of magic that you need to bottle up and keep forever isn't it and that's obviously what the project the, the, the writers they did with that because that's why it ran so long but to me that was the magic of the show yes peggy gladys all the other characters they're great but for a little boy who looked up to two men with a great friendship for me that was absolutely golden well that is very sweet of you to say that means a lot to me actually because you know paul shane and i were great friends i you know i miss him deeply to this day in fact, it, was, it would have been his birthday on Saturday next day, on the 19th of June. And it's, it's really nice to hear that from you, that, you know, that you, I mean, if you were still alive today, I'm sure that you would still be in contact with him. But it's really nice to, that, that was off screen. It wasn't just on screen. No, it was. It was definitely on, on and off screen. And we were deep, you know, deeply close to each other uh, in, a, in a very Laurel and Hardy way, dare I say, you know, which probably we'll come to later. But that's, you know, that was how we, we were. We, we, we loved each other very yeah. much as mates. And we worked together so well. That's how we got on together so well on TV and three different TV series. Of course, yeah, because then you go, you go into you rang my lord and um, Doctor Beachy, and obviously um, that the the, the the people who want to watch it also appreciate that. Like me, as a little boy watching it on a Sunday night, I can remember it so fondly, you know, um, and. For me, that was just, but the magic was you two, honestly. I mean, yes, don't take anything away from anyone else, but for me, that was what it was. And that's why I watched Yurang My Lord afterwards as well, because it was you two again, you know. Well, thanks, Dexter. That means an awful lot to me because it meant, you know, it meant Paul and I, you know, we, uh, we got on so well. And 
I saw him uh, the day before he died. I went to, you know, he was in a hospice in Rotherham where he lived and he was surrounded by his family and friends. Uh, and I drove up to see him because I got the word that he, you know, it wasn't going to be long. Uh, he'd had cancer for a long, long time. And I drove Nikki Kelly up with me. She went with me because she lives nearby. And I took her with me and we went to see him and uh, he was surrounded by his family and friends. Uh, and it was quite a wrench to say, um, cheerio and go out that ward room. Yeah. Cause I do, I wouldn't see him again. I, I can't imagine it. And I, you know, obviously yeah, that much to me. We, we were very, very close. You know. Good. Okay. Let's move on then. Cause we don't want to harbor in on it too long. The Heidi high thing was a massive success and your relationship was fantastic. Let's, um, let's, let's go on to, obviously I've seen you on the stage in LOLO Hello and, uh, you've done many different productions, um, stuff that I know well, like the ghost train, spring and port wine, all of that kind of stuff, which is absolutely fantastic. Tell me the difference for our listeners to um, between acting on TV and acting in theatre. Because really you started in the theatre and then TV. It's a very different skill, isn't it? Well, it is. It is. Um, in as much as when you're doing sitcom on TV, you're not only working uh, for the cameras, so you know, you've got to keep your performance small, you've also got to give enough that the studio audience there can laugh. So it's got to be halfway between big and small. It's a very difficult line to draw. Uh, and I'll tell you, the, the, the people that get it right today, although they are a bit over the top, and they won't mind me saying that because I love him dearly, Brendan O'Carroll, Mrs. Brown's Boys. Now, they have a studio audience in there, you know, when they record their show, and they play to them like, you know, there's no tomorrow. And that, that means an awful lot to them. Yes, the studio yeah. audience. The fact that it works on camera and it's transmitted, and we love it at home. You know, that's that's really their great secret of great success. But, you know, when you're doing sitcom, you have to be, but as I said, both. So you have to wait for the laughs. You know, if the studio audience laugh and you say your next line before they've stopped laughing, they miss the next line. And that's exactly the same as on stage, so... And that's what the you know the the, the problem uh, Laurel and Hardy had. Obviously, we we'll come to that later. But you know they used to have to time their laughs so they they would allow time for the audience to laugh and then say the next line. So was Heidi High in front of a studio audience? Or? Yes. So was you rang my lord. So was oh Doctor Beeching. All the David Croft shows were in front of a live studio audience, and he never used canned laughter. Oh, really. It's the live laughter from the audience that were in that room that night. What happens if a joke wasn't funny? Did he just let it go? <laughs> we do it again, and the audience because Felix Boness, who played Fred Quilly, the jockey, yes, I know that. He was warm up man for all David Croft shows, all of them, oh. right back to Dad's Army. Felix did warm ups for about four thousand, four thousand shows. Oh. It was amazing, man. And he got the audience in the palm of his hand, and he said, "Now look, we're going to do this again." And when you hear the gag, you will laugh, won't you? And of course, <laughs> of course. and they did. They laughed. They laughed they're like brains. They did. They just laughed again. But David always used real live laughter. Oh, really? That's brilliant. He just used a gag. He said, um, well, you know, thank you. We didn't really need to do that retake, but Wogan needs to laugh, so we're going to give him to him. <laughs> 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 that's brilliant oh so do you find yourself going a lot bigger than what you did on uh, when you were recording stuff uh, in the theater do you think that you have to put more into it to reach the audience because we're talking about performing to you know potentially 1500 to 2000 people a night is it more in the face or or what performance wise do you how do you change you know it's got to come from the voice You've got to have enough voice to fill the theatre, to get to the little old lady at the back of the gods who can't hear properly. You know, you've got to make her hear you. And that's where production, voice production training comes in. And that's where I was very lucky when I trained in my little drama school in Birmingham to have one of the best voice production teachers that there was ever in the, in the business. That's good. And, you know, you use the muscles in your diaphragm to, to, 
to throw the voice out. And uh, fortunately, I, I've never had a problem with that. That's exactly how I was taught. Use, use your muscles from your di diaphragm as well. So. The way to do it, yeah. So, you know, that, that's, uh, that's what you do. Yep. So let's go on because we are we are here on a very special day, aren't we? Just so lucky. It is lucky that today is um, Stan Laurel's birthday, or would have been Stan Laurel's birthday. One hundred and thirty-first birthday. <laughs> well, I don't think any of us are going to make it to that anyway. But, <laughs> but it's it's interesting to hear that um, it is his birthday today, and I'm lucky enough to be speaking to you today because. You've obviously got this one-man show that has been a storming success over the last how many years now? It's been, where are we, to? It's been eight years, eight years. Now. Coming wow. up for eight years. Although I haven't done the show since April 20, when lockdown started. Just uh, of course, of course, we've all been held back a little bit. At the Playhouse in, in Stratford-on-Avon, uh, and uh, Pete and Mal, Smith came to see it. They were there, and uh, that, that 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 was the last time I did it. So it's it's still in there, it's still locked in. It's like oh, access. I was, I, I was wondering about that because obviously I was rehearsing something just before we went into lockdown with my cast, and we were locked down the week before we were going to open. We were doing an ideal husband, and I know that not one of them have got that in their heads. So I'm going to have to start all over again when we go back. But um, tell us a little bit about the show then, and where you came up with that concept, because for me, like we just touched on earlier. In actual fact, that amazing friendship that Oliver Hardy and Stan Laurel had was just, again, memories as a kid of seeing those two in films. And there was even a cartoon version of them made that I remember as a child. It was the magic, wasn't it? So where did you come up with the concept of, of wanting to do that show? And what's it about for the people who don't know? Well, you know, um, being a small boy in the 1950s, which I was, uh, I used to go to the Saturday morning picture shows and hope to God there was a Laurel and Hardy on because it, it was an episode of Flash Gordon, there was a Roy Rogers Western or a Hopalong Cassidy Western, there was a, um, a Mickey Mouse cartoon or a Donald Duck. Uh, and, you know, please God, there was a Laurel and Hardy because I used to love these two guys because as a little boy, you see, as a small boy, I identified with them because, you know, they used to get into trouble with authority, yeah. with the stuff they did, as did little boys like me at the time. <laughs> Crossed the line and found out, you know, get a smack across the backside for doing stuff you shouldn't do. Uh, and that's what Laurel and Hardy did. And they became my friends. Yeah. You know, millions of, of fans of Laurel and Hardy say that they, you know, they, they were my friends. And they were. And... You know, your priorities change, your life gets uh, different, you know, you go down different roads. And that was in the 50s. And then in the 1970s, when you probably saw them for the first time, maybe, or maybe later, I don't know how old you are. Well, you know? I, I was born in 77, so I, I would have been watching them later on, yeah, like the early 80s when I was five, six. In the, in the 1970s, uh, I was a young actor you know, in my 20s, starting out, and then they started to show Laurel and Hardy on BBC Two at about six, six o'clock in the evening uh, as an alternative to the news on BBC One. So, you know, used to watch Laurel and Hardy and my love for them was rekindled at that time. Uh, and I thought, well, now this is wonderful and to see them. And I was laughing like a drain at all these wonderful films. And I didn't have a video player then. We didn't have video players then. But I used to record them on a little cassette machine, you know, put yeah. the microphone by the TV speaker and uh, record, record them and then play them back and visualise the, <clears throat> the images. But then I thought, in the 1970s, one man shows and one person shows, because ladies were doing them too, uh, were becoming quite popular then. It was a new genre. Uh, and I thought, what a wonderful idea it would be to do a one man show about Stan Law, because he had an incredibly complex life that people don't know about. You just see this little dopey little twit on the screen. Yeah. But people just don't know anything about him. Uh, his life, how he grew up, his loves, his ladies, of which there were many, mm -hmm. the money he made, the money he lost, 
Uh, and I thought this would be a wonderful idea to do a show. But at the time, I thought, I can't do it now because I'm too young. You know, you can't do a show about somebody like him. Uh, you can't tell a life story until you've had a life. So I knew I'd have to wait to do it. And it was always an ambition of mine, in the back of my mind, to do this one-man show about Stan Laurel. And I waited. And I waited. And I waited over 40 years. Oh, my gosh. Before I was able to do the, this show. And I thought, well, it was worth the wait because I can now legitimately tell that story as the man himself, yes. because I'm slightly older now than he was when he died. So it's, it's okay. Uh, but, you know, when you... Uh, I met this wonderful writer, Gail Lowe, who had won awards for her uh, plays. She writes mainly for one, single people and, and two-handers, two for two which she's particularly good at. I met her quite by accident. You know, uh, we met as a charity uh, evening. I met a friend of hers at a charity evening, and she introduced me to her, sorry. And then um, we collaborated on this idea. You know, when I, I suggested the idea to her, she said, oh, when do we start? You know, <laughs> it was that good. It was that good. So we collaborated, and uh, she wrote the dialogue, the bulk of the play of the dialogue. Uh, I put all the comedy in and various little bits of an anecdotes and stuff. That I can't, I'm not a playwright. I can write little bits, but I, I'm not a playwright. You know, mm -hmm. she she puts a play, a play together in the right way. And we did this uh, collaboration. And um, what we have now is, and this is my friend, Mr. Laurel. Of course. Which is the title I always wanted to call it, because that's how Oliver Hardy always used to introduce him in the films. I'm Mr. Hardy, and this is my friend, Mr. Laurel. So that's that's what I always wanted to call it. So I did, and she said, that's fine, that's lovely. And there we are. After what you've just said about it then, how much pressure was on you on that opening night when you first performed it? Because this is one of your heroes, and it's 40 years in the making. And just the fact that he's someone also who's so iconic and, uh, you know, such a character, as, as the double act, admittedly, but... On that opening night, did you feel a, an intense amount of pressure? Because I think I would after everything you've just told me. Let me just say politely, it was brown trousers time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I understand. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it, I, I got into it. Um, and there was one, because it's a one-man show, uh, people say to me, don't you feel lonely out there on your own? And I always say... I'm not on my own. Oh. I'm not on my own. Because on the stage with me is a little chair and a bed frame made of white tubing, white plastic tubing, which just says bed. Okay. You know, it's a bed. And imaginary in this bed is a very sick Oliver Hardy. Because in the play, I arrive in, Stan, in Ollie's bedroom as Stan, and talk to him. And that's the, the premise of the play, is to be just reminiscing, yeah, yeah. Uh, talking about their lives, you know, and all the stuff that went on, and the films they made, the money they made and lost, and all the women and all the rest. The whole, the whole shebang is in there for an hour. Wow. And I, I'm, not, I'm not alone. He's there. He's always there. Brilliant. I've always got Babe Hardy, as he was known babe, as Babe. He's there with me on the say every night when I do it. So I'm not alone. One night, I'll tell you this. One night, the first time I did it, it was at the Gatehouse Theatre in Highgate in London as part of the Camden Festival in 2013. That's when I first did it. On uh, day four, performance number four, I was getting a bit cocky and thinking, oh, I've, I've nailed this now. You know, <laughs> and, and, nailed it. and uh, I got to one particular scene where I have a couple of comic gestures and a couple of funny lines. And I, I got, because I have to cue myself, you see, into the next sequence because it's just me talking. 
I have to tell myself what comes next. Yeah. And sometimes I use a physical gesture. Sometimes I use a, a, a mental word association. You know, all these kinds of different links that we develop to help ourselves. And I got to this point when I got a, a laugh. And then I thought to myself, oh, that wasn't as big a laugh as I got there last night. <laughs> I've done that before. I'm telling you. <laughs> I didn't kill <cue> myself. <laughs> I went completely blank. I could not for the life of me think of what came next. So I had limbed a bit. I was looking at the bed and rubbing on about, you know, you'll be all right. You won't have to lie there long. You'll be up and about soon and all this. Stuff. I thought, this is ridiculous. I'm getting nowhere. I thought, come on, brain, kick in. And he didn't. Oh. And I had to ask for a line from the uh, stage manager who was sitting up. It was right up the top in a gallery above me. Oh. He could see me. Thank goodness he could see me. You know, there was contact between us because I'm a bit deaf. Uh, and if he'd been in the wings, I couldn't have asked for a prom because I wouldn't have heard the line. Oh. But I just uh, thought, this is stupid. Right, okay, do it. And I looked up and I thought, Nick, give me a line, will you? He, he realised I'd gone wrong, obviously. And he shouted the line down to me. And I said, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I just looked at the audience and I said, it happens to the best of us. <laughs> and, I carried on. and I was so furious with myself for being arrogant and stupid and, and you know, that I'd skipped over a, a essential cue. I picked it up and carried on. I got through the show about 10 minutes quicker than I normally would have done because I was so annoyed. Yeah. But I had friends in the audience that night. I had pros in. Alison Stedman was one of the, oh, the people. Really? <laughs> And when I met them all in the bar after the show, I said, oh, I am so sorry I had to take that prompt. It was just so embarrassing. They said, what prompt? Because I've done what I've been trained to do. If you're going to do something, do it with conviction. Yes. And I did. I yelled at Nick. I shouted and I got the complaint, you know, got what I was asking for back. And they said, oh, we thought that was part of the show. <laughs> That's brilliant. Quite why they thought that was part of the show, I don't know, but it didn't make any sense. But they did. I got away with this. I got I away a, with it. I this. had a feeling that's where you were going when you did it, when you just told the story. I had a feeling that's where you were going with it. But, yeah, it does happen to everyone. Touch wood, it's never happened since. Touch wood, it'll never happen again. It's really funny, actually, because one of the things that I normally ask my guests on, on this podcast is what's your most embarrassing moment or any mishaps or any blunders. And I was a little bit scared with you being professional to ask you that question to see if you had any in your bag. But there's one. Have you got any, anything else that springs to mind where you've... Got an embarrassing moment if you want one. Oh, I'd love it, please. Yes. I wear glasses. I have all my life. Uh, and without them, everything's out of focus. I can see everything when it's... I can't fall over furniture and stuff, but everything's out of focus. Now, on stage, when I'm doing pantomime, I didn't wear glasses, ever. Uh, and in this particular pantomime, I was working with Bobby Davro, and he'd, he'd rewritten the script, and he got me to do a, a bit where I pick on a man in the front row and ask him what his name was and talk to him and a little chat with him, you know. And I, I was okay with that because mostly you can tell the difference between a man and a woman from the shape they are. Yeah. On this particular night... <laughs> you I know can what see I, where it's going. I can see where it's going. I was looking at this particular body in the front row with a child on its lap... Oh, right, there we are. There we are. Right. Okay. So now then, you, sir, what's your name? Nothing. Nothing. Uh, hello. Yes, you. I'm looking at you. You. What's your name? What's your name, sir? I think no silence, total silence. And I'm hearing sniggering from behind me on stage again. <laughs> Flashback. No, to you with the child on your lap. Look at me, speak to me, tell me what your name is. Eventually, after a few more times at that, this little voice came up and said, 
Tracy. <laughs> so I said, moving swiftly on. <laughs> and then we just, I, I skipped the item because it was just, it had gone. The moment had gone, you know. It was a, a nice little gag, but it had gone. I, I ruined it. I couldn't see. I could not see. There's a rather large lady. All of the excuses, Jeff. Them. All the excuses. That's all I'm going to say. Um, I want to talk about Panto because you've been in a lovely link there. You've been doing it now for what? 40 years? 40? Um, 45. 45 Panto. years of Panto. The last one of which was, of course, in 2019 with Sue Pollard at the Grand in Wolverhampton when we appeared in Dick Whittington together. Uh, funnily enough, Mark, come in, Mark, and say hello. He bumped into her, didn't you? Why did you? I can't remember what you bumped into her for. Um, I was filming a wedding that day in the hotel that she'd stayed at before she went. Oh, to I know, yeah. 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 And I had a oh, chat no, with, I I had on the phone this morning, actually. I was speaking to her this morning on the phone. Yeah. Was with, Go on. We, we had a, a five minute chat and she was so, so nice, so lovely. And in fact, when after I met her, that's sort of the. Yeah, the, the, it was what inspired us to do the podcast. Yeah, it's the begin, beginnings of thinking about starting a podcast to do with theatre because she was such a lovely character and, and I had so much warmth from her that I was like, this. And she's told me a few stories and I was like, this is amazing. This yeah. is a real insight into uh, the workings of the theatre that people don't get to have. And it was just like. Yeah. And I called Dexter, I was like, we should do a podcast. <laughs> While Mark's in the screen, though, do you think, you know, you've worked with Gary Wilmot in Panto, haven't you? Do you think he looks a bit like uh, Gary Wilmot? A young Gary like Wilmot. Like Gary, Gary Wilmot, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we always say, too. Uh, Funnily enough, I saw Sue Pollard years and years ago in Little Shop of Horrors as Audrey, and she was absolutely amazing. I'd only known her as Peggy. Yeah, of course, yeah. And then she's got this voice. She's got a wonderful singing voice, amazing yeah. Absolutely, it was stunning. So my question about Panto is, are, are you bored of it? Are you, d does it get boring after 45 years? I think, I think if I'm honest, uh, unless, you know, never say never, but I think my Panto days are done now. Oh. Got to the age, no, I've got to the age now where I don't really think I've got the energy to put all that drag and slap on anymore and, and do all that leaping about. Um, the last pantomime I did with Sue was, uh, as I said, the grand, it was Dick Whittington, and I played Alderman Fitzwarren. And it was the first time I played a man in a pantomime for over 25 years. <laughs> Always played the dame, you know? I did, yeah, I, 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 I did I think that. I enjoyed playing the man because it was a less effort. Uh, but you know, playing a dame now, I don't know. I, All I think... of those dresses, it must be. T I, mean, I mean, well, I know it's tiring, I know it's tiring, and the runs yeah. two two months <laughs> most of the time. Daily, the big ones, you know, all twice daily. And with, when you put the dame's makeup on, you can't take it off and go out between the shows because there isn't time. No, no, of course it's not. Back on again, when you come in, you know, it's not worth so you're trapped. It's like being in, in prison, you're stuck in that dressing room, you know, between. 12 in the, in the 12 noon until maybe 12 midnight. Well, you've said that that was your last one was at the Wolverhampton Grand. And I know as well, another thing that I find really like wicked about you, amazing, is that you've come back to do these house productions at Wolverhampton Grand, The History Boys and uh, Brassed Off, which are two shows that I love completely. Oh, that was great, great fun. I am also very proud to say that I am the president of the Friends of the Grand Theatre. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. I have been now for several years. Uh, and it's a theatre that is close to my heart because it was the first theatre that I ever visited when I was a small boy to see a play. What did you go to see? Do you remember? I do. I was 11 years old. And I used to go uh, in, in Walsall, I used to go to the pictures on a Saturday afternoon. And I was looking through the Walsall Observer and I've, on the showbiz page, I found a, a, th a theatre called the Grand Theatre at Wolverhampton, and they were doing a play. And I thought, well, that'd make a nice change. Yeah. There wasn't, a, there wasn't really. I think that week there wasn't a film on I particularly wanted to go and see, so I got on the bus and I went over to Wolverhampton on the bus on my own, you know, eleven years old, and I bought a ticket. Um, which was quite cheap, I think, at the time. I can't remember. And I saw, I sat in the stalls and I watched a matinee 
of a play called Love on Ice. Now, I don't know who wrote it. I think it was probably Ben Cree, one of those creaky old Cree farces. Okay. Ben- I think it was him, uh, but it was about it was like a Romeo and Juliet in modern times about Italian uh, ice cream manufacturer whose daughter <laughs> fell in love with a, a, a motorbike rocker. Oh, okay. You know, and it, I remember the motorbike, motorbike coming on stage, and it was all very exciting, but it was a you know very very bad old comedy, and it was the first thing I ever saw on the stage, and I just went click. You know, something happened to me. Yeah. I like this. I like this. This is theatre. I like this. And something would click. So and that was the very first time I ever went to the theatre, and it was at the Grand. So you've got a a, 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 a place in your heart for the Grand that's never going to go away, really. Very special to me. It's a lovely, beautiful, beautiful theatre. I have, in the UK, let's talk about this, I have one theatre that I thought was absolutely great. I'm not going to say it's my favourite theatre, but I really enjoyed going there and i've only ever been to see one thing there and it's the many a chocolate factory do you, do you you've done something there haven't you with victoria yeah, wood that's right. that's nice yeah well my, my, my question is going to be um have you got a favorite theater have you got a favorite place to go and perform or a favorite place to go and watch something in Wolverhampton, you mean? <laughs> yeah, of course, of course, of course. I've got a lot of favourite theatres. You know, you've been around uh, as long as I have. been in the business now for f- it's my 54th year in the business. I've worked at a lot of theatres in this country, and there are a lot of beautiful theatres in this country, lots of w- uh, which I'd love to go, oh, let's go there again. Oh, that was so yeah. beautiful. You know, Most of them are built by Frank Matcham. <laughs> um, some of them are built by Phipps, you know, but, but they're yeah. the great of the theatre uh, but you know the, the chocolate factory is is very special to me do you know i just didn't understand i thought i could still smell chocolate and i didn't know whether they'd put that scent in there on purpose but i saw sweet charity there years and years ago with i think Tamsin in Outhwaite was in it and i just walked in and you went up this crazy lift elevator old school elevator to get to the auditorium and it just smelt like chocolate and i just loved it i thought this is amazing <laughs> and i think they moved the space around and they use it it's very very exciting theater um <laughs> Shift and move the seating about with different productions. They put the seating. What production, what production did you do next? It was with Victoria Wood, wasn't it? There was something with Victoria Wood that I read. Her, her play, wonderful play called Talent, okay. which she wrote. And she did it first as a TV play with uh, Victoria and uh, Julie Walters. She did it as a TV play, and it was just a one off, one hour thing. But she extended it for the stage. I wrote all kinds of different things into it, and, and myself and Mark Curry were in it. A uh, couple of very other well-known actors whose names probably won't mean anything to you, but we had a wonderful time there. And I, uh, I know Mark Curry from Blue Peter. Yes, of course, yeah. of course. In fact, I've, he's got a big birthday coming up, and we're just going to, you know, hopefully, go to a, a party to see him soon. Um, he's, uh, yeah, and it was it was lovely because Victoria, it, she directed it. She wasn't in it, but she directed. It. Was, uh, she, was she good to work with? She was. She was fascinating to work with, and a bit scary too, because she wrote it, and I had all this with Jimmy Perry on all the all the David Croft shows. You know, if you've got a, as you say, but instead of and, or if instead of the, you know, ah, excuse me, just a minute, that's not what's in the script. Can you get that right, please? And we had a bit of that with Victoria, and she was absolutely right, because I'm a terrible one for paraphrasing. Oh, me too. That's something we have in common. I'm dreadful. Paraphrase me. You know, Jeffrey paraphrase Holden. You know, I, I, it's what happens. Uh, it's just, I suppose it's laziness, really, when you think about it. But I got uh, ticked off several times. Uh, can you just get that line right, please? Because that's not the rhythm. <laughs> and she's absolutely right, because that's how the rhythm of the piece goes. And, you know, if you get it wrong, you, the rhythm goes, and the whole thing doesn't work. So mm. eventually I got it absolutely DLP, what we call dead leg, you know. Uh, so, you know, it was lovely, wonderful working with her. And I also went back and did uh, another production of Ray Cooney's Two Into One uh, at the Chocolate Factory, uh, 
Think One of the you. last things on my list to talk about is fast because you've done quite a few. Like me again, you've done quite a few fasts, haven't you? And particularly Ray Cooney. It's just tiring, isn't it? Amazing, amazing. <laughs> I, I just I just find with fast I I do it if I want to lose some weight because I'm normally running around like <laughs> You're dead right because I lost the first time I did run for your wife in 1985 I lost eight pounds in a week <laughs> running running around the stage at 90 miles an hour yes, you know and it's a great way to lose weight do a Ray Cooney fast exactly that's exactly <laughs> what I've said that to lots of people a lot of the time you wouldn't believe it <laughs> we like to finish with a quick fire round. So that's me asking you 10 very quick answer questions. Um, literally, you come back to me as quickly as possible can. With the whole Zoom thing, I don't know how quick we're going to do it, but I will hit you with the question. You give okay. me your answer, okay? Let's go. Yep. It's the quick fire round. What? Yeah. Huh? Morning or night? Morning. Pizza or pasta? Neither. Dog or cat? Cat. Favourite season? Spring. Flying or invisibility? Sorry? If you had a superpower, flying or invisibility? Flying. Have you got a nickname? Jeffo. Scale on one out of one to ten of how good you are at keeping secrets? Nine. <laughs> uh, celebrity crush. Have you got a celebrity crush? Oh, I can't. Firstly, Kendall. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> chocolate or cheese? Cheese. Say good day, mate, in an Australian accent. Good day, mate. If you could travel back in time to one time, when would it be? The nineteen thirties. And finally, what was your last fancy dress costume? Pantomime, I guess. <laughs> yeah, dressing up as Alderman Fitzwarren. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Um, it's been a wonderful having a chat with you and finding out a little bit more about you. And I know that our listeners are really going to love this epi episode. So thank you so much for coming on. My dear fellow, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you everybody for listening. This has been a really exciting episode of Dressing Room Banter for me. Take care of yourselves. You know you can listen to us at www.dressingroombanter.co.uk. Listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you find your podcasts. Remember, stay healthy. Stay healthy. Thanks, Jeff. Bye. Bye. Bye.